It's the middle of May, and I want to welcome you to my garden. This is a walk in the garden with Liz Davey on Norfolk Community Cable Television, NCTV. I'm in my herb garden, and spring has sprung. It, it is, as I said, the middle of May, and we've had some very, very warm weather so far this season. And the herb garden is starting to come alive. I did lose a few things over the winter. We had very little snow, and we had an extremely cold few days in February. Other than that, the winter was quite mild. But some of the plants were not happy with that situation with no snow cover. I lost several mints, uh, different mint varieties, so I am in the process of replacing some of them. And I've already put in another orange mint and a new chocolate mint, a mojito mint, which should be kind of fun, and also a marjoram, uh, and some other plants, uh, marjoram, and let's see what we have here, cilantro, and a basil. Uh, now the basil I will plant in my vegetable garden because I like a whole row of it. And so I put some in this garden just to have a taste of it before my seedlings come up. The important thing right now is to keep these new plants watered because it's been very dry. Uh, we were very wet, now we're very dry. This is the new chocolate mint. It's coming up next to some bronze fennel. We'll water that one too. Some herbs like it a little drier, but basil likes it a little wetter. Yeah, it needs the full moisture. Unfortunately, a couple nights from now, the forecast is for frost. After 80 degrees today, later today, uh, on Wednesday, this is Tuesday, Wednesday night, tomorrow night, they're predicting the temperature may go down to the upper 20s, lower 30s. Basil is not going to like that very much, so what I'm doing is planning to cover it. Not today, but I will put this uh, piece of a milk jug over it for the night. And that should give it just enough protection that the frost won't bother it. I'll probably put a rock on top of it to hold it down. The other thing I want to mention in the garden is the two other garden tools I have, which would be bug spray. This year the ticks have been bad. Mosquitoes are going to be once it rains. And also sunscreen and a sun hat. These are things that I've found are necessary if you want to get out in the garden. Again, we can start to use some of these herbs now that they're there. And I have some uh, Nepotella, which is uh, kind of like a mild oregano. Uh, winter savory that can be picked. Garlic chives, of course the chives that are up here, and sorrel. And today we'll be making something with sorrel and we'll be using some chives too. This is the sorrel and the sorrel comes up very early. In fact, it's starting to go to seed. And if I want to keep it going, I want to take off these seed heads and don't let it go to seed. If it goes to seed, it thinks its job for the year is over and it will not produce new leaves. So we want to get those off of there and let it keep producing some leaves. Sorrel is a very lemony, uh, sour herb. It's one of the early ones that grows. This is a French sorrel. Uh, there are sorrels that grow in your lawn, and they are called weeds, generally. But again, they are edible as well. Although the leaves are tiny, this is a much easier one to prepare. The herb garden, as I said, is doing quite well. It's getting a little more shade than I'd like, so I'm kind of moving things over to the sunniest part as I plant the new plants. Now let's move over to the perennial garden and see what's happening over there. I want to start with the plant that's a bulb that is kind of different. It's Kamasa, and it is a native to the Pacific Northwest, but it will grow here just fine. And it has these lovely tall light blue to dark blue stems of flowers, then the whole thing is going to just die back to the ground, foliage and all. So it will, this place will be gone once it finishes, just like a tulip 
or a daffodil. And speaking of those, the tulips and daffodils that are here, I've already cut the blooms off of. Uh, it's important to cut off the spent blooms. In the first place, they look pretty messy as they form their seed head. And second, by forming a seed head, it uses a lot of the energy from the bulb. And you want the photosynthesis of the sun and water to produce bigger bulbs so that you'll have nice flowers next year. I've got some daylilies coming up which will cover some of the spent daffodil foliage. It's important to leave your tulip and daffodil foliage and let it brown off naturally. It's uh, a little difficult sometimes to let it do that simply because it looks a little nasty but it's important that it gets to brown off naturally to again have enough energy in the bulb to produce blooms next year. If you cut it or even if you tie it, it can interfere with that process. And daffodils will continue to bloom for years and years and years if you let them naturally brown. I have some lilies coming up in here and we have lily beetles, little red lily beetles and one just got away. They're fast and uh, they're nasty and here's one couple right here I think we can maybe get a quick picture and what I'm going to do is just squash them and if you don't like squashing bugs you can use a product called neem oil which is a more natural pesticide I find if I come out and squash them I can kind of keep ahead of them maybe once a day or even twice a day during this particular season they used to be terrible. They have uh, released a type of predator fly or bee in Rhode Island that has come up this way and they are much less than they used to be. It used to be it was impossible to grow the summer lilies, but now it's possible. But you do need to keep an eye out for these beetles. And they're bright red, but they move pretty fast. So you have to keep watch and uh, try to squash them. If you uh, miss them and see some holes in the leaves, you can look under the leaves and see if there's a row of, tiny row of shiny little eggs, in which case you can just squash that and that will prevent more lily beetles. This uh, bulb that came free to me with some other bulbs, it's called nectar garlic and it's in bud right now and it will open a, a strange waterfall type bloom in another week or so. I'm sorry it isn't out today, but uh, it, it isn't. So in another week, we'll, we'll have that. Everything else has come up fairly well, except for roses, and they have not. Uh, a lot of people have had trouble with their roses this year. I don't have any roses in this section right now, except some old Rugosa roses, and they were just fine. They don't mind a winter at all. They're super hardy, and that's the taller rose back here. Due to my hand surgery, I have not been able to do much pruning this season, and a lot of the cleanup hasn't been done either. I am leaving more leaves than I would like. If you grow flocks, there are several ways to combat the mildew that often comes late in the season. This is the flocks, and I'm using a product called Serenade on it, which is a fungicide, which is safe to use. And you can coat your flax with that. It also works really well on peonies if you've had a problem with your peonies getting the uh, black blotches later in the season. The other thing you can do for flax is to thin it out, to take out maybe every third or fourth stem and keep the op plant open enough for some air circulation. The oriental poppy uh, foliage is up. And I have put a wire frame around the poppies and some of the other perennials that tend to flop, especially if they have heavy blooms. Uh, this will bloom again by late May, early June. This is the end of the iris, the miniature iris, and the larger iris are just starting to, to bloom. I have a white Siberian iris behind me. Again, it's in bud. But this was a little field of purple in here with these little miniature iris. 
This is a hardy geranium. Again, just starting, it has quite a few buds on it for its small size. And this is a rose, and it is, was about three feet tall. I've had to prune off most of its uh, branches. Uh, many people have had trouble with roses. This is a knockout rose, and they uh, usually come through the season and have, you know, break out their foliage and you have very little trimming to do on them. Well, this year, that wasn't the case. I had about four large dead stems. So what I did is cut it back, gave it some rose food, and I will keep it watered, and hopefully it will rejuvenate. It does have good roots. Now, because this is an own root rose, the, the uh, roots are under it, if you have roses that were grafted and you planted them deeply, as you're supposed to with that uh, graft underneath, sometimes they graft less hardy roses to a hardier rootstock. And you're supposed to, in our climate, make sure that that graft, where they connect the two, is well underground. If that's the case, you should be okay. Otherwise, the rose that comes up may be from the old rootstock and not the rose that you think you had when we've had this uh, unusual weather with no snow and a very hard freeze. I've added a few perennials in this open spot where I took out a non-blooming hydrangea. And the, the trick here is to keep them watered well. This is a uh, Achillea or Yarrow, Strawberry Seduction, and this is a Delphinium. And I may add a few other things in this area as we go along. Uh, I wanted to note that this weekend is the Garden Club sale on Town Hill. A good opportunity to get some nice perennials at a good price and help out the local garden club that takes care of the town's gardens. In back, this is a lilac, and this is a little different lilac. It blooms a little later. I have some regular lilacs. This is a Canadian lilac, and it's a little later, I guess, because maybe it stays colder a little later in Canada. But it is pink, and it is loaded this year. Lilacs seem to be having a good year. So some plants like the open winter with little snow and one freezing temp. Others did not. I have clematis that's climbing in with this rose, which is budded. I have other clematis that's in bloom that we'll see a little later. These are my tree peonies, and I don't often get to show these uh, to you or to anyone else, simply because their bloom season is so short. I have three. This is uh, the darker purple one. Uh, and then I have a white one and also a pale pink, which again I will show later because it's in very full bloom right now. This is a white alien, and it will have white ball-shaped blooms to go with the tree peony, which may still be in bloom. These are about ready to pop out. Today is a warmer day and things are just really popping. The buds are opening pretty fast. Again, the tree peonies keep their they don't keep their foliage, but they keep their structure throughout the winter. They're more like a bush than a perennial plant. Over here is a, what would, would, I would call a herbaceous peony, which means that the uh, foliage will die down in the winter and it will die back to the ground and then it comes up. Peonies often have ants on them. There is an old wives' tale that says they need the ants to open their blooms. They don't. But they do produce a syrupy mixture, sugary sap around the bloom, and that's what attracts the ants. So they don't need it, and the ants won't hurt it at all, but uh, they usually can be found. It's only a problem if you decide to bring your peonies in the house because you may bring some ants in with it. So make sure they're ant free before you bring them in. These again are old daffodils, late ones. And I'll just snap those off and keep them out of the way. Over here I have some English bluebells. And these were purchased as English bluebells. The Spanish bluebells look very similar. Uh, they have a little different blossom if you really look close. 
but these were sold to me as English bluebells, and they come up a little later than the tulips and the crocuses and the other spring bulbs and add some color. This is a Siberian iris, and it's just starting its bloom. It also needs to be divided. Uh, this is a job I did not get done this year due to my hand and some surgery I had on it, but it's on the list for another year. Lavenders didn't do too well this winter, and this one will need to be trimmed. There is life at the bottom of it, and I'll hope that that root will take over and produce some more blooms. I have a chrysanthemum right here, and it's starting in, and what I want to do is start pinching it now. Uh, chrysanthemums get pinched back by about a half an inch on the four summer holidays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of the holidays, Mother's Day, follow, Memorial Day is the first one, then Mother's Day, Father's Day, and Fourth of July, and no pinching after Fourth of July. And if you do this regularly, four times, it doesn't have to be on the holidays, but if you remember four times before the 4th of July, your chrysanthemums will be bushy and not tall and lanky. So it's important if you have chrysanthemums that have come back from previous years. Again, most of the ones you buy in the fall will not come back. But if you can find online chrysanthemum plants to plant now, they will form a good root structure and you'll have them coming back for many years. These are just field daisies and usually I have to thin those out at least once a year because they tend to spread a little too much. Another lavender and this one is the one before that has little growth is a, a modern cultivar. This is an old one, a Munstead, which is a very old cultivar, and I've had it for a long time. It has more growth than the newer one. These are aliums, again, a bulb. Uh, they will not be blooming too long, but the blooms themselves, as they dry, are very decorative in the garden. Some people even spray paint them to keep the color going. I tend to save them after they've dried and use them in winter arrangements. As so I come down here, we have more peonies in bud and hardy geraniums. These are quite different than the geraniums that you see at the garden center right now for potting out. And they're very hardy and they pretty much bloom all summer in one way or another. And again, more aliums and more roses. This is an old rose that was given to me by a friend. And again, it's uh, small blooms, it's almost wild wild type and it was not bothered. Only the newer ones seem to be really affected by the weather last year. As we go down here, I have some lupin and this is a native lupin uh, which was grown from seed and it's very pretty right now. I'm sure that if you go to Maine you'll probably see more soon up there of this similar type. There are, are non-native lupins as well that are quite a bit larger, but I kind of like this smaller one. And I like the fact that it is native and good for the native bees. Columbine is also coming into bloom and they're very easy to grow from seed if you start them early. I've started numerous columbine types and this is kind of a pretty purple one that's blooming right now. I have aliums coming up throughout the garden because one of the alien varieties I have goes to seed and I don't particularly like it every place so I do pull them when I see them in a place that I don't want them in the future. This is one of the other tree peonies and I'm gonna show all of them today because I'm very pleased with them this year. They've really done a nice job of blooming and this one's in somewhat more shade, so the blooms may last a little, little longer than the one that's in full sun. And this is the white one. This is the first one that I purchased. And each year in the fall, I put uh, some compost around the roots, 
And that's pretty much it. That's about all you have to do. And then just enjoy the blooms. Unfortunately, they don't last a long time, but while they're in bloom, they are magnificent. The dinner plate size blooms on this one are, are very pretty. They're kind of like pink crepe paper blossoms. They almost look fake, but they're not. They are real. And uh, again, they're so heavy that I do have to support the, the branches. I have a, a wire behind them. Even that sometimes is not enough and you have to stake them because the blooms are so heavy. But they are beautiful. Uh, they don't last in a vase very well, but you can float them in a bowl of water. And I've done that several times, just cutting off the blossom and a little bit of the stem and then letting it float in a bowl if you want to bring them inside. Over here I have a clematis that's in bloom right now. I have four clematis in the garden, but only one is in bloom. And we'll take a look at that. This one is called Guernsey Cream, and uh, it blooms quite early. It's been here for about 20 years now, and I always think I should prune it down, but I don't get around to it because it's very hard to see where one might prune it. It is a, called a type two, which means you can prune as a little or, or not at all, and I usually just let it grow because it's, the blooms are fantastic when they do bloom. And again, Guernsey cream is the variety if you're looking for various varieties of white. And I have a pink one and a purple one out in the garden and also a blue one. I do like the clematis. Again, uh, it requires some fertilizer and definitely water. I've lost a few on dry summers when they did not get enough water. So it pays to pay attention to their water needs, I have learned. This is a pot I put together in April. I had Christmas greens in here uh, throughout the winter season, uh, evergreens and some berries. But uh, in April, early April, I put in some lettuce starts that I purchased at the garden center and also some uh, pansies. And they're still going strong. And we are having salad pretty much whenever we want it. The first thing about a vegetable garden is the plan. And I've found it a lot easier to make a plan than to just start planting. Uh, it's important after you've gardened in a spot for several years to kind of rotate the crops so they don't grow in the same exact place every year. Now I already had the garlic planted last fall and we already have the strawberries and the raspberries. Speaking of the strawberries, they're in full bloom. And this is a very open spot. We're starting to have them form a few berries, but we still have quite a few blossoms. And those blossoms will be damaged if we get a frost. Therefore, I have this uh, floating row cover, which is a polyester, spun polyester fabric. And I will open this package and spread it over this whole berry patch on tomorrow sometime, before tomorrow night, and see if we can keep those strawberries going. I will also be taking in any plants that I have out that won't survive the frost if we get one. We may not get one, but I'd rather be prepared than lose my berries. I've already planted peas, three kinds, and I have the stakes up, and I will be putting net up so that they can climb up. We have the ones down at the end that are ready to climb already, so that's one of this week's things. I have some lettuce started and some kale and some uh, spinach, a little bit of spinach here. I may not get any spinach because we're of these 80 degree temperatures that we've had. Spinach likes it cooler. I did not get it in early enough for cool weather because we've had some pretty warm weather. And so spinach may not be a good crop for spring, but we might get a crop in in the fall. I'm continuing to plant. I use string to mark my rows. I've put up the cages where my tomatoes will go, but I haven't planted them yet. Again, we'll wait till closer to Memorial Day. I also have, I have planted cucumbers around each of the tripods that I've put up, and I will be putting string on those so that they'll have a place to climb instead of running over the ground and taking up more space. I've marked off spaces for summer squash and zucchini 
and I have open rows where I will be planting flowers and herbs. Today, and I also have plants that will be going in that I started in the milk jugs. These are broccolis, a couple different varieties of broccoli. They look pretty small, but if uh, I keep them watered, we should get some good broccoli in this area. And I will try to pick a night where it's a little cooler and an evening to plant these and water them in well. Today I'm going to plant some parsley. I started, uh, I planted two kinds of parsley yesterday, and today I'm going to be planting another variety, and this is an Italian parsley. And I'm just going to sprinkle the seeds. And I've allotted a little area to that, and I put a rock down where they end. And then uh, I'm going to water the seeds in well. You can also soak the seeds, but they're hard to work with if you soak them. So what I want to do is just fill the trench with water. And then I will come back a little later and cover them. I'm planting some green beans, and I'm going to plant these a couple inches apart, and I'll put them in the furrow. I used a hoe to dig the furrow along my line. And we'll drop one about every two inches. They tend to grow very easily. Beans are a great crop. If you have a child, grandchild, that wants to help you garden, beans are a wonderful thing for them to plant because they start, grow fast, and they're pretty, pretty much a sure thing. And then I'll just cover these with about three times their size in soil and pat it down good. Once the whole row has been planted with various things, I can take out the string. The beans should be up in another week. The parsley, on the other hand, will probably take two or three weeks before it will even start to show. I do have parsley, however, to use, and it's over on the other side of the garden. And I'll step between some strings here. This is last year's parsley that I grew from seed. And I have both curly and the Italian parsley. We're going to use some of that today and one of the things I'm making. And this is its second year, so it's coming up here to go to seed. And I'll probably let it go to seed so that maybe I'll have some parsley come up in this location from the seeds that it spreads. But parsley is a biennial. That means it has a two-year life. The first year it's just foliage, which you can use, and the second year it will go to seed. So before it goes to seed, you can certainly use it. And you'll have parsley until the other almost is ready to use. The other thing that I'm going to be using today is rhubarb. This rhubarb could have probably used a little more rain in the last couple of weeks, but it is here and I have been picking it and we happen to like it. A lot of people do like it evidently because I noticed that the store yesterday didn't have any at all, so uh, it's a good crop. Uh, I transplanted these plants here a couple years ago, so they haven't reached their full potential yet. They should get even larger as time goes by. As long as I keep it well fertilized, it's a very hungry plant, and it likes fertilizer and water, so it's important to keep track of those things, and you should get good rhubarb. Other than that, it's pretty trouble-free. These are a couple blueberry bushes, 
and they have uh, blossoms on them right now. We may get a few blueberries, not too many. Uh, we race the birds for them. We may have enough for the morning cereal, but that's probably about the extent of it. And I will probably put a net over these too. Again, uh, I will be putting a net over the strawberries or I will be sharing all of them with the birds and chipmunks. And that will, after I take off the cover to keep them from getting frosted, I will put on a net, uh, which will help keep the birds out of them. Another plant I have here is lovage. Lovage comes up really early, and it's a very old herb that used to grow in old herb gardens. If you go to an old house, very old house, you may find some in the yard still. It's a celery type uh, relative. It's very hardy. The stems are hollow. They make a, a good stir for your Bloody Mary. And the leaves taste a lot like celery. And I'll be using some of that today as we cook too. Now let's head back to the shade garden. Things are up in the shade garden. These uh, helibores have been in bloom. They're, the blooms are starting to fade. They were a, a brighter pink. And I will be cutting some of them off at least because they're coming up all over the place. Uh, I like them the, because they're evergreen and they do bloom very early. I also have a bleeding heart, some ferns, and the hosta that are coming up. And I need to take some care of the hosta. I've used tomato fertilizer on them. They seem to like that about as well as anything for fertilizer. And I also need to use deer spray and a slug preparation. And I use a slug thing that is their little pellets and they are pet safe. I don't really want to poison anyone. And some of the old slug baits were very, very toxic to pets and other animals. The one that I use is an iron formula. It's iron, I can't remember the ending of it, but it's basically iron, which plants need anyway. And the snails eat it, or slugs eat it, and they don't come back. So uh, it's a good product to use if you have hosta because slugs love them, and if we get any wet weather particularly, it's best to start early and reduce that slug population. Some of the hosta have come on so fast with the warm weather that their leaves have actually split at the ends. Uh, some of them will stay together for a while, but some of the leaves on the larger ones have actually split, and that's something that happens if you get warm weather. Here's one over here that's a smaller one, but more than being chewed, it's just expanded faster than it can take care of itself. Uh, there's one down right in here. I don't know if you can get it or not, but it just expands too fast. I have lots of different ferns in the garden. I have These are lady ferns. I have hay-scented ferns. I have uh, Japanese ferns which are very pretty, they're various colors. Uh, down further in the garden, I have ostrich ferns and cinnamon ferns, which are a larger fern. They grow well in the shade and can be a very nice part of any shade garden. I have a little area here that I'm planting gradually. I've added a young hosta. I have a A perennial, uh, what's, what, what it is here, a uh, lobelia, which will have tall blue flowers in the fall. I'd like to plant some things in here that will be showier later in the season. We also have a ground cover called sweet woodruff, and sweet woodruff is an herb and can be called the May herb. It's the May wine herb, and we'll be using that in the kitchen too. It is a uh, edible. It has a little white flower right now. It's not native to our area, but it makes a lovely, lovely little woodland ground cover. It smells like uh, new mown hay when cut or bruised, and especially in the fall. It's a, a nice little plant to have as an edging. It's short, never gets over about six inches, and lasts pretty much all summer. 
Now let's head back by the pond. This is May apple, and May apple is in bloom right now. You can see a little bloom way down under here. Uh, if you walked by a bunch of it, you wouldn't see it at all, and it will make a little uh, apple-y type thing. I don't think I'd eat it. I don't know whether it's edible or not, but I don't tend to eat it. Let's see if you can see the little white bloom in there. But mostly it's grown for this lovely foliage that comes up in the spring. The only problem with it is it is in the spring. And it is one of the, what I would call a spring ephemeral, which are plants that come up and bloom in the spring and then they disappear completely. So by the end of summer, this will be completely gone. In fact, in two months it will be gone. But hopefully some of the other things will take over. We have more ferns. There's another hosta here and there. And it may just be an open spot for a while. The mountain laurel is gradually moving this way, so it uh, or may take over this area eventually. It spreads, so you don't want to use it in a spot where you want to keep it very tight and small. But if you have a woodland spot that could use some spring interest, mayapple is a wonderful native plant to put there. It likes this dappled shade. And before the trees completely leaf out, they get some sun. That's true of most of the spring ephemerals. They like to have some sun, and then they go to sleep when the shade becomes too heavy, only to come back in the next season. Many bleeding hearts are that way. Again, a lot of the woodruff around and other plants. This was a uh, marsh marigold and it had yellow blossoms. Again, it will die back, as will the daffodils, but the sweet woodruff will continue on and give me some room to put in a few shade annuals, impatiens, or some other type of plant. Just got my fish pond going, and the filter is taking out some of the things. It is not clear yet, and we have had some foam on the pond which uh, indicates that it's not in balance yet. I did have the plants put in because, because of my hand surgery, I wasn't able to lift them. And when I had someone here, namely my son, who could lift them, I decided to take advantage of his presence and get the pond plants in a little early. Again, if they really are predicting a hard frost, I need to cover those plants. And I'll use some of the landscape fabric and probably fasten it down with the rocks around the pond, just to give them a little bit of extra protection. They do have some protection being, <coughs> excuse me, in the water, but uh, they might need a little more. The roots will be fine. Some of the foliage may go. I have a lot of plants in my garden shed, and this begonia was kept in the house all winter uh, in the dormant state, in a back bedroom where we don't heat too much in the winter. Uh, and in April, I noticed little shoots coming up in the plant, so I brought it downstairs, put it in a sunny window, and watered it, and it's already blooming beautifully. It's very tender. Again, it will go in the house if we do have an impending frost. Another begonia down in the pot here, which will have some uh, annuals added but it will go back in the shed until the warm weather returns, which should be probably Friday. These are the ostrich ferns I was talking about. They also spread, so some of them will get removed as they come up in places where I don't really want an ostrich fern. The fish are getting fed, and I added quite a bit of uh, new water to the pond. We pumped out some of it and added some fresh water. So the water that comes out of the tap is about 50 degrees. And so I'm using the fall and winter food for another week. And hopefully they'll come up and have a bite. There's probably a frog in here somewhere. I've had a frog, the same frog, all winter. And yes, he's here. I see him over on this side. Maybe we can get a picture of him to add later. But he stayed with me all winter, which is quite a surprise. The pond has not frozen over more than once or twice. And I guess he must have gone down to the bottom 
and stayed down there or gone somewhere else because every sunny day he was back and now he's over among the plants. He's a large frog. I don't know how long these frogs might live, but I expect he'll be joined by some aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and cousins before the season is over. I usually have quite a few frogs in here, but this one has stayed here the whole time. Now the fish are coming up for their snack. Same six fish, they made it all winter. Again, I put the ice melter in to keep a hole in the ice, although I never turned it on more than once or twice during the very coldest times. I saw a heron fly over. Hopefully my, he spotted my fake heron and that was enough to tell him that he needn't stop here for the fish, so he didn't. Now let's go in and use some of the things we were able to pick in the garden to make some things to eat. Here we are in the kitchen and doing a few seasonal dishes. And the first one I'm going to do is a rhubarb dessert and I'm going to start by making a crust. And I'm going to give you the full recipe, but I am making a half recipe. Full recipe is a 9 by 13 pan. Uh, I'm using an 8 inch pan, so if you ever want to cut a 13 and by 9 pan recipe in half, you can use an 8 inch pan and it'll work out just about right. And I'm going to start with 1 and 3 quarter cups flour, a half teaspoon baking powder, and an eighth teaspoon of salt, and I'm going to cut in some shortening. You could probably use coconut oil as well, but I'm using shortening. And that would be three quarters of a cup. And I'm going to use my fork to cut it in. You could use a pastry blender if you have one, but a fork also works. And we want to make crumbs with this. And to that I'm going to add a tablespoon of milk and a beaten egg. I'm going to pour that right in and I'll mix that around to make a dough. And I have a greased pan and I'm going to just pour this mixture in and And then I'll press it into the pan and up the sides about a quarter of an inch. And just use my thumbs to do that. And pat it down. It's pretty easy to work with. And the original recipe called for four cups of rhubarb. But I'm running a little short on rhubarb because I've been making things like rhubarb muffins and rhubarb pie and and other things. So I was a little short, so I decided to make it strawberry rhubarb. So I have one cup of rhubarb and one of strawberries, which I'll pour into that crust. And then we are going to mix The original recipe calls for one and a half cups of sugar. Because I'm using strawberries instead of all rhubarb, I cut that down to one cup instead of one and a quarter. You might want to cut it further, depending on how tart you want it. And I mixed in with that sugar two tablespoons of flour and one teaspoon of cinnamon. We're mixing that around well. And then I'm going to sprinkle it over the top. the fruit. And then I have one egg, three quarters of a cup of milk, and one teaspoon of vanilla. This is going to have a kind of a custard base, so strawberry rhubarb custard squares. And we'll add the vanilla.
and I'm going to pour this over the top trying to cover as much of the sugar as I can although some of it will, will not be covered and that's fine that will go in the oven at 425 for 20 minutes and then we'll turn the oven down to 350 I'm going to use some of my herbs and make a potato salad. And I've cooked up some of these little, little uh, potatoes and drained them and chilled them. And I'm going to add some of the herbs from the garden. And I really don't have much of a recipe for this, but I am adding about a tablespoon of chopped chives and about a tablespoon of minced lovage and maybe a tablespoon and a half of parsley. This is a, going to be very herby potato salad. And for a dressing, mix that to, these together. I'm just going to use some lemon juice and olive oil. It's a very simple, simple potato salad. And I'm going to shake those things together in a jar. And I'll use maybe one and a half tablespoons of lemon juice. Again, you can adjust that later as you wish. And olive oil. Maybe three tablespoons. And we're going to definitely add some salt and pepper. To the mixture. And I'll shake these together and add them to the potatoes. Actually, this is quite good if the potatoes are even still a little warm. These have been chilled, but... And then just add the lemony vinaigrette to the mixture. And stir that around. The potatoes will soak it up a bit. I have an herby potato salad and I can garnish that with a little, a few leaves of some of the fresh herbs, some parsley, a bit of lovage, and a flower from the thyme, from the chives. And I'll put that over this way. A finished dish. Another thing we can do with the chive flowers is vinegar. And what I need to do, I'm going to move this over, and I'll heat up a little of vinegar on this burner. And I'm going to put uh, chive flowers into a little canning jar and I'll heat up the vinegar just uh, not even quite boiling just so it starts to bubble a little bit and then I'll add the vinegar to the chives and we're going to get a lovely purple chive flavored vinegar. Chive flowers are edible but they are too strong to eat whole. If you want to use them as a garnish, you need to break them apart so just the little florets are included. Otherwise, they get uh, a little too pungent. I'll heat up this vinegar and add it. And I'm also starting my other dish, which will be a sorrel sauce. And for that, we've cut up some sorrel. And the way to cut it up easily you have the leaves, and if you put them down on the board, and then you can use your knife to take out the stem. And then just cut the leaves in pieces. This recipe calls for just larger pieces of sorrel. So that's how you prepare it. Of course, I did wash it before as well. 
get some of those things out. I think it's warm enough, then I can just pour that in this little jar, little canning jar. And I will let that sit in the jar for several days at room temperature and it will turn a lovely purple color and we'll have a lovely uh, chive scented vinegar. The next thing I'm going to do here is the salmon with sorrel sauce. And I have already started it because this step took a while. And what I had used with this one, and I'm, I'm going to refer to my recipe a little bit so I don't forget anything. Uh, I used one cup of chicken broth. Uh, you could use fish stock if you happen to have it, or vegetable broth, and one chopped shallot. And I boiled that until it became this glaze. Uh, most of the liquid is gone. And at this point I'm going to add two tablespoons of vermouth. And I'm going to continue cooking this until it becomes shiny. It will start to boil hopefully soon. It will boil a few minutes. And it becomes kind of shiny and uh, and thick. And there we have it. It's gotten quite syrupy. And I will add one half cup plus two tablespoons of sour cream. The original recipe calls for cream fraiche, which I don't have and could not find at the store. And sour cream is a very good substitute for it. And we're just going to stir that in and heat it up briefly. You want it thick, and it, and it is indeed thick. And then I'm going to strain it into another pan. We've got the flavor from our uh, shallots. Some of this off of it. And I have a nice creamy sauce. And I'm going to be adding the sorrel. And I have about a pint of sorrel to add to that sauce. Seems like quite a lot, and it is. We'll put it back on the stove and heat it and keep stirring it. And we want to just wilt the sorrel. And it will lose a lot of volume. And now I'm going to add some butter, two tablespoons, one tablespoon at a time. And I'll turn the heat down a little. And you can see the sorrel, sorrel has disappeared pretty much into the sauce. finish that with a little lemon juice and some salt and pepper. And I'll use white pepper on this one. And I'm going to add this to a, a clean dish. a nice piece of cooked salmon on top. Ideally the salmon would be cooked fresh and still be warm. 
it will warm somewhat in the sauce that we've cooked. And so this is our salmon dish and the dessert bars. Happen to have some others. Strawberry rhubarb bars, uh, herby potato salad, and oh, we need something to drink. Let's see what we can find. Some May wine, perhaps, or mock May wine, which is what I have. And that we kept cold. For mock May wine, I use white grape juice and the Woodruff, sweet Woodruff, which a handful of it has been steeped in the white grape juice for several hours or overnight. And I'm going to pour about half of that over a few strawberries. And then I'll add just plain seltzer to give it a little buzz. Normally one would use a sweeter white wine and champagne, but this is a mock version, non-alcoholic. Much better for the middle of the day. It's a very refreshing drink. And, and we have a little flower arrangement to go with our dinner items. See if I can arrange it a little from behind. I have some of the pink lilacs, the Canadian lilacs, the bl bluebells, English bluebells, and a few of the field daisies, as well as a few of the white lilacs that are blooming right now. And that would be our dinner for today, uh, made with some of the herbs from the garden and some of the fruit and a nice arrangement of flowers to go with it. This has been a walk in the garden with Liz Davy. I'm Liz Davy, and you've been watching NCTV Norfolk Community Cable Television.